the Gospel of John chapter 6, and let's read our passage this morning, beginning in verse 35. John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And verse 37, all that a father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And the title of our study this morning is The Problem of Unbelievers, The Problem of False Followers of Christ, Part 3. And last time we looked at some external observation or observations about uh, false followers. They are thrill seekers. Uh, they have this habit of going to church. They have this outward piety that we see. They profess Jesus as prophet, king, rabbi, and lord. But everything is shallow. Everything is superficial. Then we progress from observing the external to uh, observing the internal. And there we see the crowd uh, was seeking the Lord because of the food. They have deficiency in their understanding. Uh, they have backward or reverse priorities in life. They cannot understand spiritual truth. They prioritize earthly things. And they want to work for the food that perishes. And they want Jesus to, um, to feed them um, continuously. And they demand for a sign. They ask for the Lord's credential. And in other words, they are uh, self-centered. They're earthly-minded. Uh, they, they love themselves too much. But then they're spiritually ignorant and do not want to come to Christ and believe. That is in verse 36. Now the question last, last week is, uh, why is that? That's a question. Why is that? Why the crowds don't want to come and believe? And another question is, why you believe and, and others don't? That's a big question. And here in our text this morning, uh, we'll try to answer that question. The Lord Jesus now explains the problem of unbelievers, listen, in God's vantage point. This is the problem of unbelievers in God's vantage point. In verse 37, we see the core of the issue. The core problem of unbeliever is the sovereignty of God in salvation. That's a problem of unbeliever. Why the crowds cannot come and believe? Answer, because they cannot. That's the, the answer. In, the, in God's uh, standpoint, unbelievers are unable and unwilling to believe. Because coming to Christ and believing in Him does not depend on man's will, does not depend on the free will of man, but on God. And this is the subject we want to study today. And the verse we want to consider is verse 37. Let's read the verse again. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So let's talk about that for a moment. This verse, verse 37, is crucially important to understand salvation from God's standpoint. Very crucial. This is um, a summary of God's sovereignty or power in salvation, verse 37. And right off the bat, I want to give you the main idea of our study. And the main idea is this. God knows that in order for the crowd to have the ability to come and believe to Christ, it requires divine enablement. 
It requires divine enable, enablement. It is only those whom the Father enables to believe will come to Jesus in faith. That's the main idea of this verse. The Father needs to give them to the Son. Now let's try to dismantle this verse together. Look at verse 37. And we see the word all in verse 37. And the all is a group of people. Correct? The all is a group of people. And so we ask, what is the identity of this all group? And first, just by looking at verse 37, the all group are people owned by the Father, right? They are people possessed by the Father, a group of people that according to verse 37 will be given to Christ, the all group. And the group of people who will come to Christ, and it is the group of people that Christ will not cast out according to verse 37. And so these people are distinct from the unbelievers. These people are distinct from the crowds, right? And obviously the crowd is not part of the old group. It is a special group of people. Now we ask, how did that happen? How did the Father possess them? You know, how did the Father own them? So whenever we ask this question, uh, we cannot avoid talking about what? The doctrine of election. And that is a controversial doctrine. Now this doctrine is a sermon series in itself. We need to spend many Sundays to uh, unwrap this doctrine. But for now, I want to give you um, a flyover of this doctrine. This is a simplified version, you know, just to help us answer the identity of the all people. Because I want you to understand the identity of the all people here in verse 37. Question is, who are the all in John 6, 37? The all that will be given to Christ, uh, the all that will, Christ will never cast out. Now, to answer that, we need to go to... Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. So today we'll be um, kind of do some Bible study in Ephesians chapter 1. So when we study the scripture, we study the whole Bible, okay? Not just the context of John chapter 6, that is the immediate context, and there is the book context, which is the gospel of John, but then there is this uh, larger context, and so we need to examine other uh, passages in Scripture. Because why? Scripture interprets Scripture. And here in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. And so the us there is the Christians. Us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul wrote this letter expressing his blessing and worship to God because he, God the Father, blessed the us with every spiritual blessing. Now the us group of people here in Ephesians and the old group in John chapter 6 are the same. Are the same. And then he continued in verse 4. Look at verse 4. Just as He, that's the Father, chose us in Him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. And so how did the Father possess the all in John chapter 6 or the us in Ephesians chapter 1? How did He possess them? Well, He chose them. He selected them. He favored them. And when did that happen? According to Ephesians 1 verse 4, when did that happen? Before the foundation of the world. He chose them. In other words, in eternity past, when there is no creation, when there is no time and space, He chose them. When there was nothing but God, He made the decision to choose. And those He will give to the Son. Now we ask, what is the motivation behind the choice? Um, look at verse 5. It says there, 
So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. And here we see that it is in love, that's the motivation, He predestined us. So again, the us and the all in John 6 is the same people for adoption as sons. Now the word predestined in simple term means God determines beforehand the adoption of the believers. He determined beforehand the adoption of the believers. God the Father obviously has only one son, that is Jesus Christ, and the rest of us are adopted sons and, and daughters, right? Now, verse 5, it says, it is according to the kind intention of His will. In other words, the motivation behind the choosing is love. The love is not mere emotion, the love that we see here. It is a decisive, discriminating, and selective kind of love. The love that gives favor to some and not to all people. And then we can see the intention of God in choosing, and that is according to the kind intention of His will. And so we see the how did God... Acquire the all, the all group? Well, he acquired them by choosing them, giving them favor before the foundation of the world. His intention is love, right? Kind intention, motivated by love. And so that's what we see so far. Now turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Beginning in verse 1. All right, so 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. We see the foreknowledge of God the Father in choosing. Peter said, uh, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen. There's the word again. Who are chosen. According to what? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ. They were chosen to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Here we see Peter is saying that the choosing of God is according to His foreknowledge. And so what do we mean by the foreknowledge? What do we mean by that? Well, the term simply means to know before, to know before. So God knows a reality before it is even real. That's the idea of foreknowledge. Why? Because He's omniscient. Um, he's all-knowing. Now, um, if you turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, this... Um, word for knowledge is repeated here in Romans chapter 8 in verse 29 and this is what the theologians call the golden chain of redemption in Romans 8 verse 29 it says for those whom he foreknew that's the same language in first Peter for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son why? So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And this whom he predestined, he also called. And this whom he called, he also justified. And this whom he justified, he also glorified. Now here we see the salvation from start to finish. Okay? And the se sequence starts with where? The foreknowledge. And it ends with glorification. So here's the sequence, the golden chain of salvation. First is the foreknowledge, and it ends with glorification. Notice that foreknowledge goes before predestined, right? Foreknowledge, he predestined. He foreknew before he determined the destination. Now this is where it gets complicated. And uh, evangelical churches are divided with regards to the understanding of the foreknowledge of God. And the question here is this. Is there something that He foresees in us 
that affects his choice. We know that how he acquired uh, the all in John chapter 6, he acquired them by choosing them. Okay, by choosing them, by selecting them, by giving them favor. Now the question is, is there something that he sees in us that affects his choice? What is the criteria of his choosing? Very important question. What is the criteria of his choosing? What is the basis of his choosing? What's the criteria? Is there something in us that influences his decision to choose? Now, I mentioned earlier that there are um, controversy or um, division with regards to the understanding of this word for knowledge. So, basically, there are two camps. Okay, there are two camps. The first, uh, the first camp is, uh, you may call them the Armenian camp, the Armenian view of for knowledge. And the newer term for this is the provisionist view, provisionist view. And most evangelical churches belong to this camp. This is the majority opinion. I don't know how many churches we have here in Swift, but this is the majority opinion of evangelical churches. And what is that? Well, according to the Arme Arminianism, God's foreknowledge refers to his foresight of sinners who, through, who throughout time would come to believe in his son that results in their election. Let me give you an example. God, before the creation of the world, is looking down the corridors of time and saw Mr. Bob down the road. By the age of 47, he will believe, and therefore God elected him. Does that make sense? The foreknowledge, according to Armenian view, is this. God, before the creation of the world, looking down the corridors of time, and saw you, by the age of whatever, 35, 47, or 50, that you will believe the gospel, and so therefore God elected you, chose you. That's the uh, Armenian view of election. And therefore God elected Mr. Bob, and destined him to be saved. On the other hand, Mr. Jones did not believe the gospel, and therefore God did not elect him in eternity past. And so basically, what this group is saying is this. Election is based on the sinner's response to the gospel. And since the crowd in John chapter 6 did not come and believe, and God saw them before time, before eternity pass, or in eternity pass, and therefore they're not part of the old group. They're not part of the old group to be given to Christ. So I hope you get that. And so basically this um, idea or uh, theological assertion of Arminianism teaches that the Lord's election is based on his foreknowledge of whether people will choose him to believe or not. And so most evangelical churches are leaning towards this view, unfortunately. And my problem with this view is this. First, listen. It seems like the criteria of, for election is based on men, not God. That's number one problem. It is based on the ability of men to choose, not God. It is based on the decision of men. If men will not choose God, God is powerless. He cannot elect him. It seems like the free will of men is more prominent than God. It looks like God's will depends on man's will. I cannot elect you because you, you don't want to believe. If men will reject the Lord Jesus Christ, even if God's intention is kind, even if his motivation is love, if men will reject the Lord Jesus Christ, it seems like his kindness is not kind enough. It seems like his love is not loving enough to make his son appealing to sinners. His love is not loving enough to make sinners believe the gospel. That's my first problem. 
Now the second problem that I have with this is it makes God react in history. Not ordaining it, not determining it. It makes God reacting in history. And if God is not deciding what will happen in the future, that makes him what? Not God, because he's not in control. And therefore not sovereign. Why? Because he's just responding to men. He's just responding to men. You know what men will do to his gospel? If that is the case, God does not own history. That's my second problem. Now my third problem is this. Man has something to boast to God. Because man initiates and triggers God's decision. The question here is, who flips the switch? Is God or man? If you want to ask who holds the switch in salvation, the Armenian view will say, man, not God. It's my free will to choose. Because we need to inform God of what he needs to do. We need to let him know of our decision before he does his electing. I have a real big problem with that. Now that is basically unbiblical. It exalts the free will of men. But again, sadly, this is what many professing Christian practice. Many churches believe that sinners are in control of their salvation. What do I mean by that? Well, since sinners are responsible for their own decision, the grace is offered, and it's really totally up to you. Here's the grace. Here's the good news. It's really totally up to you. If you want to believe it or not, grace is available. It's totally up to you. If you want to take it or not, and the difference between you and your unbelieving neighbor is this. You know the difference? It's that you made the right choice. That's my problem. Friend, here's, here's grace. Here's the good news. It's up to you if you want to take it. Now, how did you believe? Because I took it. Because I made the right choice. That's boasting. The difference between you and your unbelieving neighbors is that you made the right choice and they did not. You know, if only they make the right choice to follow Jesus, but unfortunately they didn't. Now, I reject this view. To be honest, I despise this. It really it's kind of gets me up bonkers. Why? Because this is why we have a lot of false Christians. Many people believe they're saved because they... They make this mental decision to follow Christ. Mental decision. They made this uh, mental assent to follow Christ. And as long as they still believe in their mind, even if their lives are not showing godliness, even if their lives, lives are not demonstrating the gospel redeemed life, as long as they don't utterly reject Christ, as long as they totally not walk away from God, they're still saved. As long as they made this positive profession of faith. In my mind, I still believe. Even if the action is not showing it, and they're still stay saved, they're okay, and they're part of the chosen. And so... I don't want you to believe that. I want you to believe the second camp. Hopefully I can convince you. And this is the reformed view of election. A familiar term for this is the doctrine of grace. Now I want to go back to the question. What is the criteria of God's choosing? Did he see something in us that influenced his decision? Is it because we believe that we become part of the old group. So what do we really mean by foreknowledge? And I said earlier, the term means to know before. This is not just God knowing in advance our decision, although that is part of God seeing us. But it's not just that. 
It's not merely knowing some facts about us. It's not simply knowing some events in our lives. But this is God knowing us personally. And so foreknowledge is God making a decision to enter into a relationship with us. This is God setting His love on us. And the word know has a personal and intimate meaning. For knowledge, the word know in the Bible, like Adam knew Eve, it has what? Intimacy. There's intimacy, not just knowing some facts about us, but He knows us. He knows His people truly, deeply, personally, and savingly. That's the idea of foreknowledge. He knows you. Foreknowledge simply means God sets His love upon a person. And one Bible teacher said, God's choice of men and women for salvation is based on God's decision to set His love upon them, not His knowledge of what they will do. That is, God made a decision to love you, to have a personal relationship with you. Now, let me back up this um, for a moment, okay? So, what we're trying to fix here is this. How did you come to Christ? Did God saw something in you down the road by the age of 27? You received the gospel, you accept the gospel, and then He chose you? Or the other way around? He chose you regardless. That's what I'm trying to solve. So to solve that, we need to go to Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9. You know, we can read beginning in verse 9. It's going to be... Um, It's going to be a straightforward, long reading from verses 9 to 26, okay? Romans chapter 9, verse 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father, Isaac, for through the twins were not yet born, not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, not yet born, that had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to His choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. God made a choice. What shall we say then? Verse 14, there is no injustice with, with God is there. Paul said, may it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very reason or for this very purpose, I raise you up. Why? To demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. And you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who receives his will? On the contrary, who are you? O man, who answer back to God. In other words, know your place. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? And so the argument is the, uh, you know, the, the potter in the pot. And so who's in control? The potter, not the pot. 
in verse 21, or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And then verse 23, And He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom He has also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Now there's a lot in here, but a straightforward reading of these verses teaches us that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He is sovereign in choosing Jacob over Esau. It does not depend on their action, doing good or bad, but according to God's what? Free choice. Free choice. He's sovereign on whom he wants to demonstrate his compassion. He will harden those he wants to harden as an act of justice as a demonstration of His wrath and, and punishment. God is sovereign in, in raising a Pharaoh into power. And He is also sovereign in what? Destroying Him in shame and death as an act of judgment. And if He wants to be a vessel of, of wrath, God is free to exercise justice. He's free. Why? Because he's God, and we don't tell him what he needs to do. We don't need to inform him. Certainly, he does not need our permission. He does what he pleases. That's the essence of being God. That's the essence of being God. And this is what I believe, because it is consistent with Scripture. It makes God God. It is God-centered, not man-centered. It makes God's will freer than man's free will. God is more free than us. He is the potter. And we're the clay. And so what can we say about the identity of the all in John 6.37? Let's go back there. What is the identity of this all? Let's read the verse again. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Let me summarize that to you. The all are people chosen by God before the foundation of the world. God's motivation is love. God's intention is kind. It is according to His foreknowledge, and that is knowing a person personally, uh, intimately, and savingly, not based on what we do, if good or bad, but God chooses them freely. Freely. Free to bestow mercy to whom He have mercy. He is free. Therefore, the all, and I want to say this, the all here are not nameless individual. The all here are not nameless individual. God the Father knows them by name. Because why? He chose them. Personally, personally. And so when the Bible says, whosoever believes, the whosoever are not nameless individual. He knows his sheep. He knows his people. God knows who they are by name. He knows his people. And Jesus knows exactly who they are. Why? Because the Father gave it to him. That's why the Bible says he will save his people. He will save his people. And when the God the Father sent his son on a saving mission, listen, folks, Jesus knows exactly whom he needs to save. He didn't went down on earth and hopefully, 
hopefully, you will come to Him. He knows exactly the people He needs to save. He went on a mission with a specific purpose. And those are the people chosen by His Father in eternity past and given to the Son for salvation. Now, let's go back to verse 37 again. And the second word I want you to pay attention is the word give in verse 37. The Father gave the chosen people to His Son, the old group. And the word give implies the idea of a gift. In other words, God chose people as a gift to His Son. Believers are the Father's love gift to the Son. If you're a true believer in Christ, you are a gift to His Son. Where do we see that? Well, in John chapter 17, let's read this. So bear with me. In John chapter 17, and I hope this will bring some encouragement to you. In John 17, beginning in verse 6. These are specific men. These are the old group. These are the chosen people. And in verse 6, Jesus is praying for them. He said, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you, have, you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believe that you sent me. And look at verse 9. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And then he said in verse 11, I am no longer in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Go down to verse 24. Go down to verse 24. Father, I desire that they... Also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 25. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them. And will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them. The them, them, or the them here is the all in John 6. And then he said, and I in them. And I want you to know that if you're a true believer in Christ, you are the Father's gift to the Son. You are precious to Christ. And because of this, according to verse 37, go back to John chapter 6. And because of that, you will come to Christ. That is the certainty of evangelism. Those who will hear the word, they will come to Christ. Jesus said, but Jesus said, my sheep knows, I know my sheep, and they hear my voice, and they will follow me. All that a father gives him will come to me. They will come to Christ. And the crowds, they didn't come to Christ. Why? Because the father don't own them. The father didn't give them to Christ. That's the reason. Now the uh, third praise we want to examine here is this. Look at the, uh, verse 37 again. Look at the phrase, will come to me. And that phrase speaks of certainty, 
because of the word will, it didn't say may come to me or might come to me, but will come to me. And the word come, like I said last week, from a human standpoint means forsaking sin. From the human standpoint, repenting from sin, forsaking sin, and embracing the Lord Jesus fully. That is in human standpoint, the word come. However, in God's vantage point, the word come has an idea of irresistible grace. The word come has an idea of irresistible grace. Grace in that term simply means that God's grace is so powerful and mighty that it can enable a sinner to come to Christ. In other words, if we are left to ourselves, we will never come to Christ. We are unable and unwilling to come to Him for salvation, but because of God's grace and His mercy, which is so powerful, He makes us willing to come to Christ. Willing to come to Christ. He did not violate our free will. He changed our will. He changed our will. He renewed our will. He enabled us and made us willing. And apart from this, if you go down to verse 44, apart from the irresistible grace, apart from that, according to John 6, 44, it says there, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me, draws him. And that's really heavy. We're going to talk about that next time. But for now, what we need to understand is the crowd did not come and believe. Why? Because they cannot. Why? Because they are unable and unwilling to come to Christ. Why is that? Because they were not given by the Father to the Son. Why is that? Because they were not chosen by the Father. And the reason why you come to Christ and believe is not because you're better than them. It's not because you're, you, have, you made the right decision. The reason why you come to Christ, it's not because you're smarter. It's because the Father favored you and gave you to His Son. That's the testimony of Scripture. That's the reason why you come to Christ. It's God's doing. And so the last phrase we want to look here in verse 37. Verse 37 again, Jesus said, And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. And so when Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, He knows that everyone will not come to Him. That's not discouraging to Him. In fact, He knows from the get-go that the crowds will not believe Him. He knows it right off the bat that these crowds will not believe Him even before He fed them. Look at verse 64. In verse 64 it says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. Right from the beginning. And who it was that would betray him. He knows these crowds are fake. In fact, he knows that Judas will betray him. Go down to verse 70. He said, Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. And we need to be mindful of this. People will reject Christ, not because the church has a poor programs. People will reject Christ, not because we have boring activities, or bad church strategy, or the pastor is not good enough, people will reject Christ because salvation is not dependent on man's will. Salvation depends on God. Who chooses people to come to Christ. Salvation is guaranteed by the Father as a gift to His Son. And those people will surely come to Him. And those will come to Him, Jesus said, He will never cast out. 
And so we don't manipulate people, we don't trick people, because salvation is never by man's free will to choose. And so this is the comfort that we have in Christ. He will cast out superficial and shallow Christian. He will cast out fake Christians and those who seek him for earthly pleasure. He will cast out the likes of Judas, but he will never cast out those who truly come and believe. Those who come to him weary. Those who come to him burdened and in need of a teacher. In fact, those who don't know where to go, go down to verse 66. And if you're this person, guess what? He will never cast you out. John 6, verse 66, let's read that. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. That's okay. He knew that. That's okay. He's not discouraged about that. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. If, you, if you're that person, no place to go, only to Jesus, and guess what? He will never cast you out. So folks, the problem of false Christian. It's not only the depravity of sin. Our problem is God who will judge that sin. And our problem is not the depravity of sin, the sin that makes us self-centered and self-lover, you know, seeking Jesus for earthly pleasure, the sin that makes us reverse our priorities, the sin that makes us deficient in our, in our understanding. This is not just the problem of sinners. The bigger issue of unbelievers is the sovereignty of God in salvation. Why? Because God chose people who would believe. He made us believe. He caused you to believe. He decides whomever He wants to choose. He's free to do that. And folks, we cannot do anything about it. And our proper response to the sovereignty of God is what? To plead for mercy. Plead for mercy. You need to be like the tax collector. In Luke chapter 18, you need to be like the tax collector. You know, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. Why? Because I can't do anything to be saved. Plead your case. Ask for mercy. And Jesus said in Luke 18, verse 14, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. What's, your, what's the difference between you and your unbelieving neighbor? Be careful in how you answer that. Be careful. If you're angry with God right now because you step on your free will, guess what? You better humble yourselves before Him because you don't have any choice. And if you truly know God, you know that He's merciful. If you throw yourself to Him and plead your case, and He will never cast you out. You know, we love our freedom so much and our rights, right? Now let's turn our Bibles once more in 1 Corinthians and we will end here in 1 Corinthians number 1 or chapter 1 sorry 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Let me give you another identity of this all group okay of this chosen group Let me give you another identity of that group okay In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 26, Paul said, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, 
not many mighty, not many noble. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despise God has chosen. The things that are not. Why? So that he may nullify the things that are. Why? So that no man may boast before God. But by his doing you are in Jesus Christ, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it, is, as it is written, let him boast, boast in the Lord. So what's the identity of this all group? They are the nobodies. They are considered by the culture as fool and weak and really good for nothing. Why? So that let him boast, boast in the Lord boast in the Lord. So we cannot come to Him unless the Father draws us. And that is our encouragement. We allow God to be God. And we know that He's kind. He's merciful. His intention is kind. His motivation is love. And so we can be assured that if we throw ourselves to Him, since we cannot do anything, our free will cannot do anything, that we can plead our case. We ask for mercy. And according to Scripture, if we truly ask for mercy and cling to Him, Jesus said, you will be justified. He will never cast you out. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. There's nothing in us that is lovable and savable, but yet you chose us despite of us. What a merciful and gracious God. Nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.